Hey everybody, uh, welcome back here to the third of three videos on safety. This one is specifically on human factors and human limitations. I'm going to talk about people and I've, I've glossed over this a little bit. However, it's really cr critical that we understand that people have certain limitations. And uh, we have these human factors. Why? Because we're human beings, because we're people. And it really does speak to that need because we do have these inherent limitations based on our age, our physical size and stature and our strength and our reaction time and a whole bunch of other factors. It really does speak to that reason and rationale why engineers are the ones ultimately accountable. That's why we have to make sure we're engineering safe products, we're eliminating hazards, we're assessing risk, According to the last video, video two, and if you haven't watched that, it's about failure modes and effects analysis. And then tying that back appropriately, setting priorities using the safety hierarchy to reduce risk. Now, you could probably argue that this lecture, this video should have been the first one because it really is the predicate. It sets, it sets up the, the whole notion of why that stuff is so important. But I did want to come back in video three and just kind of nail it for you and help you to think back to the importance of people, understanding your population, understanding your customer, understanding the audience for which you're designing. And that might be the intended audience or the unintended audiences. And both of those have potential consequences if a person interacts with your product. So I have actually one objective, just like prior in the, in the second video, I have just one objective. And that is, I want you to be able to explain a few of these human limitations, either cognitive limitations. Those are things that are related to the way we think about decision-making, about our ability to evaluate and make decisions based on risk, but also the physical characteristics that people have. So just three to five in total, both cognitive and physical, the things that are associated with what we need to consider when you are designing a product. If you're in BSE 508, if you're going through senior design, I want you to be thinking about these with respect to the usability of your product, the safety, the optimal performance, and even how people might maintain and interact with this product over the course of its lifespan. So let's just jump right in. So let me just say this, most likely, Almost all of you, in fact, I don't know if I can think of a single project in senior design where you're not going to have some type of person, product, or person system interaction. You're going to have people interacting with your product or system in one way or another. So it's really crucial that you know something about them. And human populations vary across the planet, but we all do have some fairly common characteristics. I mentioned this, I just alluded to it, but also know that for many of you, when you get out into the real world, when we get beyond UW-Madison and senior design, you're going to be developing and designing products that are going to be used across the globe in different countries, in different cultures, and people that are speak a language that's different than English, like you might speak here in the U.S., and it is important that you understand what those limitations that are a result of, of people in different cultures and different parts of the world. And your product um, might also be used in unexpected ways. Um, if, I'm, if I'm developing a rototiller, I'm just going to give you this as an example. I did some work back in the day where we had to look at the safety associated with rototillers because we had farms that were buying large numbers of rototillers with large numbers of people operating those. Instead of just like a small family that has a garden in the backyard, these were actually being used as a commercial product. So it's important to think about how might that product that I'm designing today be used five years from now in a way that I might not have intended for it to be used. Now I wanna go back to this. This takes us back to video number two, where I talked about, we refer to this in public health as host, agent, and environment. I'm preferring to call it person or people on the right-hand side of the slide, hazard, which is the same as agent, 
and the environment. And remember when I talked about the environment, it's not just the physical environment like the temperature and the coefficient of friction and the relative humidity and how, how wet things are. We're talking about cultural environment, social environment, political environment, the environment in the landscape, what types of people live or work in a particular environment. Um, and I wanna talk about this with respect to a very specific thing that I observed probably back about 20 years ago when I lived in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis and St. Paul. I lived in a small neighborhood. It was actually a growing neighborhood with a lot of kids, a lot of children. And this neighborhood was in an area that was rather hilly. And it also um, bordered some, uh, some wetland areas and some areas that were naturally quite wet. In fact, the uh, street that I lived on was called Lakeside Trail. And part of that was we adjoined some property, which was all basically wetland. And so because of where this neighborhood was laid out, we had a number of water retention structures like this that were a combination of holding ponds that take the runoff from the pavement, from the trails, from the roads and the streets and, and hold that water. It was also, there was wetland type characteristics. So you see the cattails and you see the plants. These were really awesome for wildlife. We saw deer, we saw all kinds of waterfowl, birds, and some really cool things, especially in the spring and the fall. And one particular morning I was out walking and it was in the latter part of November. So it was just as things were starting to freeze and I walked around the corner and all of a sudden I hear sirens and fire trucks and we had converging in this area towards which I was walking. What had ended up happening was a young child prior to school starting, went out with his backpack, I think with her backpack, and had decided to just take a little walk out on this frozen surface of this pond. Again, it was late November. You can guess what happened. There was a thin sheet of ice, probably an inch or less of ice, broke through. And while she was only into about her waist, um, it was mud underneath the frozen surface, underneath the ice surface. The water was only a, a foot and a half or two feet deep, but it was mud and she was not able to get herself out. Fortunately, she was able to yell and scream and there's lots of people walking in this neighborhood. People knew not to try to get out there and save her because they could have had a second or a third person. So we had people go out, ultimately they used ropes. They were able to get a couple of firefighters out. They roped them together. They might've even used ladders but they were able to extract this poor little girl who was very, very, very shaken. And very thankfully, this incident did not result in a drowning or a death, which could have in fact happened. So you might look at this and you might say, well, going back to this slide, how does that interact? So we do have a hazard, right? We've got a pond. Um, do we have people? Well, yeah, absolutely, we've got people. We're in a residential neighborhood. We've got a lot of children. This neighborhood was known for having a lot of kids. And we also have an environment. We've got all of these things coming together. And let me go back. You see this slide, if you back off from this picture, if you walk north, here is what that area looked like. First of all, there was a nice little trail leading down to this wetland, leading down to this pond. This was actually not a real trail. This was used by animals and it was also a natural waterway. But just north of it, less than 100 yards, actually probably less than 50 yards, was this playground. So we have this natural situation where we've got a hazard, we've got an environment, we have both a social environment, we've got a, an environment where we've got families, we've got children, we've got a playground, we've got a natural source of inviting children into this environment, and we've got the characteristics of a young person, you know, a little girl who was probably six or seven, getting ready to get on the bus, or either first grade or kindergarten bus, and take the bus to school, but she had this natural affinity to walk out on this newly formed ice on this pond. And thankfully, the result of it was a, is a good story. It was a positive ending, but very predictable. And that's why we need to be thinking simultaneously about the person, about the hazard and the unique characteristics and potential sources or the potential ways in which that hazard could cause harm to people or the ways in which a system could fail in the case of a failure modes and effects analysis. And then also the environment in which all three of these different factors come together. 
Let's go back to people. So with people, we've got to be thinking about the age of people. So obviously a seven-year-old child waiting for her school bus is very different than a person who's my age. Um, I'm going to have some limitations compared to a young man or young woman who maybe is in their 20s. So if I'm designing a machine or a set of controls for a particular process, my reaction time is going to be probably 50% more than that young person who's in their 20s. I may have more experience, so I might be able to have the ability to do things more safely, but also because of my experience, I might be locked into doing things that are unsafe. So we've got to think about age in many different respects. We also know that people who are younger are much more adept at using digital technology, whether that's a smartphone or digital controls on some type of a process or some type of a piece of equipment or as a way of getting information. We've got to think about language. This one's obvious. If we're going to rely heavily on warnings and signs and instructions and information in an operator's manual, we've got to think about the language that people speak. We've also got to think about if, if we're relying on written communication to improve safety, can the people in my population read? We take it for granted. Most of us in this country, in the United States, can read Many areas of our population globally, many people can read, but there are also pockets of population where relying on written language, even if you provide it in their language, may be more difficult. We've also got to think about gender. Gender obviously is going to have some impact on decision making. Also, if we think about gender, um, for example, women of childbearing age, we have to think about the safety implications associated with toxins, with products, with chemicals, with pesticides. Also, people of different genders have different ways of thinking about risk, especially if you think about that with respect to also the interaction with different cultures. We also need to think about physical size and strength. Am I designing for a 180 or a 200 pound man who's 5'10"? Or am I designing a product for a woman who might be an average of five foot four and weigh 145 pounds? Very different in terms of the physical dimensions of a process or system or a piece of equipment. And then last but not least is level of training. So is this something that we're going to expect a lot of training? Is this something that a novice should be able to operate? All of these are important. We've got to be thinking about all of these and then some. I also, want to, I also want to point you to some, some very specific human characteristics. And when I've done this presentation in the past, I have found these sort of silly on Facebook and, and the web, you know, these memes showing people um, often doing some really, I'll, I'll just call them really stupid things. And the one that I think about is a person who's got all kinds of electrical equipment and he's installing an electrical outlet above a pool and he's got an aluminum ladder across the pool. I mean, just obvious, a, a situation waiting to happen. And, and I, you know, I try to tend to use a little bit of humor with that. And what I've learned is we've got to be careful. People, people are people. People are going to do, and I'm just, I'm going to say this, myself included, People are going to do stupid things. People are going to use your product or interact with your design system in a way that you may not have ever intended and you need to be able to anticipate those types of misuses. When we're, when we're using something, when we're interacting, whether it's an environmental system, uh, the little girl who's walking out onto the frozen surface of that pond, we are always, as human beings, we're weighing the risk associated with the benefits. If I'm that seven-year-old little girl, there's a there's a lot of benefits. This is cool walking out there, but she she clearly did not understand the risk associated with walking on an inch or less of ice on a late November day. A lot of risk, right? But we don't do a good job of evaluating and weighing the risks versus the benefits. Similarly, we tend to overestimate the benefit and we underestimate the risk. If you do the math, when I drive to and from work every day, it's about a 14 mile drive. And there's a lot of mornings I'm thinking like, ah, I'm gonna push the speed limit. I'm gonna go, instead of going 55 miles an hour, I'm gonna go 75 miles an hour. Please don't tell anybody I said that. 
But what that's going to do, if you if you do the math on that and you take my average speed over a 14 mile trip, I'm only going to get there like a couple of minutes earlier if, as opposed to me following the speed limit. And yet there's a tremendous amount of risk. If I go 20 miles per hour faster on a public highway, not only do I risk getting a ticket and having big increases in my, my car insurance, but I also risk the probability of a higher severity collision. We tend to overestimate benefits, especially time savings, and we underestimate the associated risks. The other thing that we tend to do is we really do project our fears about risk and safety onto other people. And yet we ourselves, for whatever reason, we tend to take risks that we wouldn't want family members or loved ones or even our employees. If, you know, if we have workers that we're responsible for, we might choose to, to take a specific risk. But when we see our workers doing it, we cringe. Um, for some reason, we just decide like it's gonna, it's it's something I'm willing to accept, but I don't want to put others in that sort of a situation. We all we also tend to overestimate our true abilities. We all have very specific limitations that are based on our size, our strength, our reaction time, our ability to pay attention, our ability to not be distracted. A lot of you probably think like, yeah, I can safely drive a car as long as I keep my speed limit down. I can probably drive a car and send text messages. Well, guess what? If my reaction time goes from a half a second to a second and a half, the consequences, if somebody pulls out in front of me or there's a, a need to break in the case of an emergency, something walks out in front of me, a deer jumps out in front of me, we overestimate our ability to be able to react quickly and in time. And that happens across all domains of physical limitations. And, and likewise, this last bullet on the right-hand side, we're very limited by these factors. Our strength, our reaction time, our ability to handle overload, our ability to stay awake. We get fatigued, we get easily distracted, and we don't necessarily understand that well in terms of how those limitations affect our personal safety. So the bottom line on all of this is engineers need to take this into account when they're designing products because we almost all share these common characteristics. Let me tell you one other thing here before we kind of wrap, move toward wrapping up. When we design a safeguard into a product or system, it does result in some other predictable behavior. This could be a shield, a guard on a piece of equipment. This could include the safety switch on an elevator. Okay, so think about this. So back in the day, back in the early 1900s, when elevators became the preferred methods of getting people up, up and out of larger buildings, as buildings began to grow in terms of their height, we added stories onto buildings, we began to see skyscrapers in big cities, we started to see a lot of elevators. And unfortunately, these elevators resulted in some just horrible, catastrophic human injuries. And that's one of the reasons why we had, we had people who actually, their full-time job was to run the elevator. You would go into a high rise in Chicago. And actually, I remember this from when I was a little kid in the 60s. You would go into a high rise in Chicago or another big city and, and you had to talk to an elevator operator. You couldn't just do it yourself. And the reason for that was because these elevator doors at times, if you didn't know what you were doing, the elevator door could come closed on you and we had these horrible accidents. The elevator door came closed, the elevator went down or it went up, and you can imagine the types of injuries that occurred. They were really, really horrible. So we began to build safety devices into elevator doors to prevent these horrible injuries from happening. We built in electric eyes. So basically, if you interrupted a light beam, it would shut the elevator off or it would at least keep the elevator in place. You'll also notice that a lot of elevators have safety switches on the door. So there's a whole strip along the side of the elevator door so that if, uh, if you contact it, if there's a person interrupting or they pulled back on that door, the, the elevator doesn't force itself closed. Those were all put in, a, in uh, elevators as part of a design to safeguard things. But what's happened is we've begun to use the elevator safety switch as a control, right? So if I'm in a building and somebody comes running down the hall saying, hey, you're in the elevator, hold the elevator for me. 
you typically aren't going to hunt around and look for the off switch. Instead, what you're going to do is you're probably going to use that safety switch to keep the elevator from closing shut. That's not necessarily why it was designed, but we need to think about that from the perspective of how a safety device has changed human behavior. We see the same things with safety devices like on big four-wheel drive vehicles. When we have our first ice storms here in a place like Wisconsin, or even more so when I lived in Minnesota, the first vehicles that you would see in the ditches would be the big SUVs with, that had the, the roll bars and the four-wheel drive and you know just these big trucks and you'd see them upside down. In my thought on this, and I think this is proven out in the research, is we tend to overdrive. We tend to push safety devices to their limit. They, they have a limit, right? We can't overuse, we can't come to depend on safety devices, but it is something that people tend to do. It's the same when you go, and right now we're in the midst still, we're kind of getting to the final phases of the global pandemic of 2020 and 2021. You see people who say like, yeah, I can pretty much do anything. I can go grocery shopping. I can go out and, and go lots of places. I can fly across the country because I've got a mask on. Well, the mask was not, face covering, if you will, was not designed to allow you to resume your normal life. It was designed to help you do the absolute bare necessities like grocery shopping or if you're a student going to class. It was not designed to allow you to just resume your normal life and to really push the limits of that safety device to the wall. And what's ended up, what ended up happening was that some people who came to depend on those safety devices didn't really quite use them correctly, and it did have consequences. The overuse of safety devices is something that you need to predict, you need to think about, you need to anticipate. It doesn't mean you shouldn't include them, but you do need to think about what those unexpected, unintended consequences and misuses, how they might alter your design, how they might alter human behavior. All of this human limitations, our tendency to overuse safety devices, our limitations as human beings, all point back to this idea that the safety hierarchy is crucial. It is critical. It's why the engineering code of ethics is crucial. If we can find ways to eliminate the hazard, design it out, find different ways to do a job, to do a task versus safeguarding devices, warnings, trainings, and personal protective equipment, all those are good. All of those uh, work in some fashion or form, but they all have severe limitations. If we can eliminate that hazard through the design process, that's greatly preferred. And if we have to employ the other strategies, the safeguards, the warnings, the training, and the personal protective, we do those in combination with one another so that we get the optimal effects. Let me just go back. I failed to talk about something in my second video, and I think I'll use it here to wrap things up with my conversation about the safety hierarchy. That is, in the first video, I talked about ice chunks falling from buildings on the University of Wisconsin campus. So what we've chosen to do is we've chosen, in video two, I talked about safeguarding devices. I talked about barricades and barriers, and I also talked about warning signs and the fact that those tend to not be particularly effective. We don't necessarily see them. We don't necessarily agree with them. We don't necessarily read them and recall them at the right time. Because of that, they're not terribly effective and yet they are required. You have to warn people. What would we do in the case of Steenbach Library? If we wanted to eliminate that hazard entirely, we would probably want to redesign the roof, right? Or we would want to find ways so that those chunks of ice, whether we're talking about heating the roof surface or providing some other type of mechanism to protect people or eliminating or repositioning the sidewalk so that you physically separate the hazard from where people are likely to be, that's going to be preferred. Now we do that a little bit with the barricades and the ropes and the obstacles, but we know that people are going to override those in many cases, just like they might override an elevator safety switch or they might overdrive their four wheel drive with their uh, anti-lock braking systems and their, you know, crash-proof bumpers. We're gonna, we're gonna ten, tend to overdrive and overuse safety systems. We need to account for that. And again, in the case of Steenbach Library and other buildings, if we could find a way to eliminate that hazard, we're gonna have a far greater impact on the reduction of risk. With that, I believe that's my last slide. Conclusions. 
engineers are ultimately responsible. We know this because of the engineering code of ethics, because of the importance of adhering to the safety hierarchy. Risk analysis is vital in the design process. Hazards that are identified should be controlled in a manner consistent with the safety hierarchy. If we can design out that hazard, that is much more highly preferred than finding ways to provide personal protective equipment, giving, giving students who are walking around campus around falling ice hazards, giving them hard hats, personal protective equipment. Obviously, that seems ridiculous. So the things that are higher on the safety hierarchy are preferred. People are people. We're all going to do things that you would consider to be silly, not using our common sense, even stupid. But that's just because we're people. And we've got to come to accept that. And we've got to become to know that our responsibilities as engineers are, we are the ones that are held accountable when those kinds of things happen. And then finally, we should not always depend on people doing things and acting safely. Uh, we need to design, we need to engineer to prevent and protect and reduce the kinds of losses that we've talked about in these three videos. I would look forward, if you have any comments or, or uh, examples or stories or suggestions on these three videos, I would love to hear from you. I will put my contact information in the comments with this video um, and look forward to hearing from you. And I'll talk to you soon. Be safe, be careful, and make sure you're designing your products and your systems to accommodate human needs and human safety.